Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just thinking that uh, in the near future, probably I need to communicate earlier the the aim so that if possible, it can be projected here. Okay, sure, sure. That, that's also a great thing. So maybe after a meeting, we can talk about that. But we are live from Facebook yeah, now. Yeah. So, but of course, I can't okay. give us the open, open prayer in them. Let's, let's flow. All right, uh, let's pray. Our dear even Father, we want to say uh, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful time you have given us uh, that we can be able uh, to study your word and learn from your word. Oh God, we pray that you may help us to understand uh, what we are going to study and learn today. We pray that, oh Holy Spirit of God, may you help us to be receptive at your truth uh, that is going to be drawn uh, from your word. He wants to pray uh, for our brother who will be leading us, uh, that Lord, you will be with him, and that Lord, you fill him with your, uh, with your wisdom, and that Lord, with your spirit, and that he will be able to lead uh, this study, O oh God, uh, without fear, but with boldness, O oh God, and authority. Uh, we pray, O oh God, uh, for other friends who are still joining us, that, Lord, you may help them to join us without uh, difficulties. Uh, Lord, we pray that you bless our time together in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Great. Uh, so I can start the song. Yes. Great. All right. Uh, so the hymn for tonight uh, is done by Elvina M. O. Elvina M. O. And uh, we'll read the first verse. It says, I hear the Savior say, your strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me your all in all. So the title of the song is Jesus Paid It All. And it's at the cross of Calvary where Christ has said it is done. And therefore, he paid for all our sins and all of our iniquities. So that's the song for tonight. Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say, your strength. Indeed, is small child of we, nay, so chant pray. Find in me your in Jesus paid it all. Oh, do him my own. Sin, I left a queen some stay. Ye were still white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find your power and yours alone can change. The lepers pause and change the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, oh, to him my own. Sin. I left a green some stair. He was still white as snow. For now, thing good ever, whereby your grace to clear our world. My garments white in the blood 
of Kavri's love. Jesus paid it all. Oh, to him my own. Sing, I left it with some stairs. He was. Still walk on. I stand in him complete. Jesus died, my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus. Oh, do him my own. Sing, I left a queen some stay. He washed it white, that's no. Amen. Yes, amen. Thank you, Brother Costa. And welcome to each one of us here. Welcome to Chilambi. Welcome to Easter Jemima. Welcome, Prince. And welcome to others who will be joining us on Facebook. And even for those who will be watching us much, much later. Thanks to technology, I know that sometimes even a week after, a year after, you will still find people watching the episode. God bless you all for joining us. I'm not too sure whether you said opening prayer, but I trust that the Lord will, uh, uh, will lead us into all truth. The Spirit of the Lord will lead us into all truth concerning the discussion or the study of God's word that we are going to have this evening. I was trying to write down some of the words of the, of the song or the hymn that our brother Costa sang. And of course, I didn't get it, but then uh, the, the chorus, or at least uh, three references I found there was, it said, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left it dark stains on me. Jesus has washed me white as snow. And Brother Potter, this is a very prophetic song concerning tonight's study. And I'm sure later on in the study, we will be coming back to the words in this song. Jesus has paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left it dark stains on me, and he has washed me white as snow. I, I hope uh, those are the right words of, of the hymn. Again, I welcome you to tonight's study, and we are looking at, uh, we'll continue what you've been doing for some weeks now, Matthew chapter 18. No ordinary man that the uh, a study the life and ministry of Jesus Christ as recorded by the evangelist Matthew. And we've done chapters one to 17. We've done some parts of 18. And today, if God permits, we are going to conclude chapter 18. The gospel of Matthew chapter 18 has five main stories in there. There are five main stories which are recorded in there. Uh, the, the first one, we see the disciples arguing amongst themselves, the one who is the greatest. We see the disciples arguing amongst themselves, the one who is the greatest. Then when, uh, when you get that in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 5, then in verses 6 to, verses 6 to 9, we see Jesus talking about people who tempt others to sin. Then in verses 10 to 14, we see Jesus teaching them on, in verses 10 to 14, we see Jesus teaching them on the parable of the wandering sheep or the parable of the lost sheep. Then when you come to verse 15, up to verse 17, we see Jesus, uh, sorry, up to verse 19, we see Jesus teaching them on how to deal with brothers who have offended us. 
So as we see the outline here, the first, uh, the first pericope of the chapter deals with who is the greatest. The second pericope deals with the temptations to sin. The third, the parable of the lost sheep. And the fourth one is, if your brother sins against you. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 18, verses, when we come to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, it is one story. And the story is such that it's one very, very interesting story. I mean, almost our whole Christian faith or a portion of our Christian faith is based upon our understanding of what Jesus Christ teaches here. And so I don't know if Prince is able to uh, share with us Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. And indulge me as I read the whole, the whole, uh, I mean, passage. If not, I can read it from my end here. Uh, I'm sure I can share my screen as well. So, okay, yeah, so the screen is already being shared. So let's start from verses 20 on the problem of the unforgiving servant. And that's how it goes. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold. Okay. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold. Sold. That he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this time, that's from 26. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out, of, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I'll pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his servant, when his fellow servant saw what he had, saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgive you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servants as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debts. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Amen. 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 Okay, so uh, we see from this passage that we just read that the main theme that Jesus Christ was speaking about here was the subject of forgiveness. And what prompted this teaching was the question which was asked by Peter. And this is what Peter asked, as we already know, how often will my brother sin against me that I should forgive him? And the answer which Jesus Christ gives, as many as uh, Peter asked, as many as seven times, it was, it's obvious that in the Jewish culture, the number seven had a certain, uh, it signified a certain completeness so that uh, it was believed that 
seven was the maximum that a, a person, seven times was the maximum time that the person could uh, keep offenses. So Peter asked him, how many times should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? And let us not forget that this particular question is following what Jesus Christ had taught them in, in verse 15, where he says that if your brother sins, in verse 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I'm reading 17. And if they so refuse to listen, tell it to the church. If they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you find on earth will be found in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. So this was what Jesus Christ had already taught them, that if your brother sins against you, if your sister sins, sins against you, go to the person in private, discuss the matter. If the person doesn't listen, if the person doesn't listen to you, you can now uh, approach, uh, approach other people and go with them. If so, this brother does not repent or does not listen to you, inform the church. If the church comes in and the matter so uh, persists, treat that person as you would an unbeliever. So Peter hears this and he's now going to ask Jesus Christ that, uh, okay, so I understand that when my brother sins against me, I'll need to forgive him. But how many times can I keep on doing this? Seven times, which was the maximum. I mean, I'm sure Peter was expecting that once he says seven times, Jesus would clap for him and say, wow, Peter, you've now really matured in the faith. For you to even think that you are able to forgive your brother seven times, bravo, Peter, you are reaching where I expect you to be now. Jesus doesn't answer in that way. He rather reads as people would say, he rather read the bar. This version that we read here says 77 times. In some other versions, uh, sometimes they would interpret it to mean like 70 times seven, which would be 490 times. And talking about this matter of forgiveness, so we, we, we've already listened to the passage. So I would want us, there are some questions which uh, later on I'll be coming to ask uh, I'll be coming to ask to ask us, and I see all of us our names. So uh, please don't be offended if I. I'm not sure you'll be offended though. But then I'll be every now and then I may mention the name of someone to get your view of of, of how to answer this question. So when we talk about forgiveness, what do we actually mean by forgiveness? And please, if you would want to talk, you just lift up your hand. I think. Friends, you can now uh, uh, take off the screen, uh, the, the passage. Yeah, so that those who show their video, you can see their faces as well. Uh, so please, uh, be per you are permitted to share your video. Uh, I mean, to let us see your video and also come in anytime that you'd want to join the discussion. So when we talk about forgiveness, what exactly are we talking about? For the Christian, or forgiveness, for any other view, uh, anywhere, it's an action. It's not just an emotional state. Forgiveness simply means to wipe the slate clean. It means to pardon or to cancel a debt. When we talk about forgiveness, we are talking about the fact that I am going to give up, give up my right to hurt you, even though you, you have also hurt me. So joy has hurt me, but if, if, I, if I have forgiven joy, then what it means is that I will give up my right to hurt joy back. So I have every opportunity to hurt joy back, but because I have forgiven her, I will not do it. That is forgiveness. And there are several examples of that that we see in scripture 
one very clear one is when uh, we, uh, Kim, mm -hmm. Kim Saul had been chasing David mm -hmm. to kill him for a very long time. Then some way, somehow, Saul rather falls into the hands of David. And David has the opportunity. David can kill Saul, but David decides not to kill Saul. That was forgiveness. So forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. It means to wipe the slate clean. It means to pardon or to pardon someone or to cancel a debt. Again, when we talk about forgiveness with respect to a Christian, we are not talking about something which exists in a vacuum. Forgiveness for the Christian, all that I mentioned, are, are mm. actions of forgiveness that can be done by any other person. But for the, for, for, for the Christian, our definition of forgiveness is that it is our natural response to what God has already done for us. Our natural response to what God has already done for us. So when the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus, he makes a statement which I believe is necessary for our discussion this evening in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. This is what Paul says. And I'll be reading from, from that point up to 5, verse 2. So Ephesians 4, 32, Paul says, Do be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgive you. Follow God's example, therefore as dearly beloved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave, and gave himself, himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I'll read it again. Uh, if, if you want how a Christian should define forgiveness, that is how Paul is teaching us to, to, to define forgiveness. And that's what Paul says. Forgiveness is being kind to one another, being tender hearted to one another, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave us. As God in Christ forgive us, therefore we become imitators of God as beloved children, and we walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Amen. So when we talk about forgiveness with respect to the Christian, that is what we are talking about. The, the reason why the Christian must or the reason why the Christian forgives is because it is a natural response of, of the Christian to what God has already done in Christ for him. So we know that in time past, we were also sinners. And God deservedly what we deserve uh, or the, our fair sentence, what we deserve as our fair punishment was God's wrath. But we see that God in Jesus Christ has forgiven us. Because of the death of Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven our sins. And Paul now says that because of this thing that God has done, there should be a natural response that should come out of you, even as you. And this natural response is that you also forgive other people. Forgiveness then does not become something that the Christian should struggle about, but rather it should be something which naturally flows out of the Christian. And why does it flow out of, why should it be the second nature or the first nature of the Christian? It should be because it's, it's our response to what God has done in Christ for us. So brother Costa had hurt me. How should I handle him? I simply have to go back to what, what did God do in Christ concerning my own hurts against God. If I'm able to know that, then it informs me how I should deal with Brother Costa. 
Brother Joseph has helped me. He has said things against me. How should I deal with him? By uh, Ephesians 5, 1 says, I should be an imitator of God. I should be some, someone who is copying God. If I want to be godly as, as a beloved child of God, then I'm going to walk in love and I am going to forgive him just as God in Christ has forgiven me. So when we talk about forgiveness for the Christian, there it's, it's not something which we now have to learn to do or it doesn't come about because we have to decide whether in this instance, is it good to forgive them or uh, we, it's, it's not up for bargaining. We don't, it's not something that we can bargain about. You can bargain about what you want to give to someone, even that there are issues to be said there. But when it comes to forgiveness, there is no bargaining. God in Christ forgive us and he expects that we do the same to others. And that's how come when we come back to the parable that, that we read, this master who forgave his, his servant owed him uh, maybe in current currency, uh, let's just use the US dollar. His, uh, his servant owed him $10,000. This servant couldn't pay. He forgives this servant. Then this servant who has been forgiven has gone out of the palace. He meets another servant, let's call him servant B. And this servant B owes servant A $1,000, which is just about one tenth or just a fraction of what, uh, of what the first servant owed. But when he left the palace, he quickly forgot whatever had taken place at the palace. He quickly forgot that someone had actually forgiven him of his own sins. He forgot that once he was a debtor to someone and this, pers and this person forgave him his debt in full. And so when he comes out, how should he deal with someone who owes him something which compared to his own debt was is minor? He should have forgiven. Yet this servant does not do that. He rather does the opposite and he bundles up uh, his fellow servants in jail. And so this evening, uh, very soon I'll be coming to us. So let us prepare. We, we can switch on our videos and our other things. I'll be asking us some questions on, on this matter of forgiveness, on this issue of forgiveness. Uh, is it something, uh, why do we, I'm going to ask for instance, uh, what, should a person show repentance before I forgive him? I have a brother who always sins against me. And even when he offends me, uh, he does not even have the courtesy to, to say that I'm sorry, so that I think of what should I forgive him or I shouldn't forgive him. How do we deal with such a case? Jesus said, uh, uh, in the question we read, he said, you must forgive 77, 77 times. What if the person for, uh, sins against me 78 times? Is it justification now to say that, brother, you have gone beyond your limits? The limits that God gave me, I've gone beyond it, so I'm not going to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to forgive you. Then perhaps if there is time, another question that we could look at is, is there in a, what are the consequences of unforgiveness? If I don't forgive, how does it matter? Then also, uh, we usually hear people say that forgive and forget. Is it, uh, is it possible to forgive and forget? Then perhaps we could look at how practical ways in which we could actually express forgiveness. But, and what makes it difficult for us to forgive those who have offended us? Uh, then, uh, uh, like after I have forgiven the person, is there a way that I can still decide that uh, I've forgiven you, but I'm not going to let you come around me again? Is that really forgiveness? Uh, then how quickly must I forgive? Uh, what happens if I don't forgive? Then how do I know or when do I know that I have truly forgiven someone? 
So uh, brothers, uh, brothers and sisters, I trust that Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 gives us this very important lesson on forgiveness. The other, uh, other verses that we could go to, but at this point, it, it's uh, already 30 minutes into the, into the study. So I want to hear from you as you help us to, as we all help uncover this, uh, this theme of forgiveness. Thank you. God bless you. So, uh, Joseph, I'm sure you can switch on your, your video. Chilambi, Brother Costa, Sajimaima, Prince, you can all switch on your videos and let us discuss this issue of forgiveness that Jesus Christ is teaching us. To begin uh, with. Can I go yes, ahead? Uh, yes, okay. yes, please, Brother. Okay, it says in Psalm 66, verse uh, 18, it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not answer my prayers. So okay. one thing is, if you don't forgive, how can you don't forgive and forgetting you expect somebody to forgive you? How does that work? You have to forgive, you have to, as a Christian, or as a child of God, you have to lay that foundation for people to see that you forgive and forget. There's a human nature, which is sometimes is because when you see the person around you, you remember that. But after a while, that thing has to be wiped away. As a child, you have to let it go. Because those things that unforgiveness is very a strong way when it comes to a child of God as a Christian. It hinders you from many parts of your life. And it brings, um, it brings sadness, hatred, bitterness. And now it's you who is carrying the burden. But if you forgive, if you, because uh, our father says in the, uh, the Lord, uh, the Lord's prayer said, you forgive us, we should forgive us our trespasses. So you have to forgive. This is not bad or there's an option towards that one. You have to forgive it, no matter how hard it is. Sometimes true that is your breakthrough, but you never know is that thing is a test to you and you hold it on. And sometimes people holding on these things and it look like a burden. It tend to be sadness. They're not happy because it's you carrying the burden. But if you let it go and forget the person, the Lord will deal with the person in his own way. That's what I believe. Okay. Thank you very much, Sister Jemima. Okay. God bless you. Amen. Okay. All right. So, uh, any other, uh, any other person to let us know what uh, his initial thoughts are on the passage that we read, Matthew eighteen, twenty-one to thirty. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello, friends. Go yeah. ahead. Hello, yeah, Prince, your son. Um, I, I would say be, before even we forgive. Hello, please, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. We can hear you. Please, can you hear me? Yes, this. we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, so um, I would say that before even we forgive. Before we forgive, already we are sinners who don't deserve to be forgiven of our sins. But yet, Christ died for us and forgive us of our sins when we still didn't deserve any forgiveness. So then, who am I not to forgive my brother when he or she sins against me? Okay, all right, thank you, Prince. Um, hello. Yeah, I think my, my network went off. But what I was yeah. saying, forgiveness, I don't forgive just because um, I just want to forgive, but I forgive because I've been forgiven. And then Christ died for me even when I was a sinner and I didn't deserve anything. So then, if my brother forgives me, just like in the story of um, the parable of the, um, the servant that the master forgave, who am I to 
to also forgive my brother or my sister. So it's not about the number of times he or she does the wrong thing, but it's about the state of my heart. Because I know I didn't deserve it and God forgave me. So I won't also keep or harbor somebody's sin in my heart. I'd rather let go. Like I should let go of my sins and forgive me. So I think that's what I will say on this. All right. Thank you, Brad Prince. Okay, so any other can just lift up the hand, then I'll let you speak. So maybe then then uh, the okay, brother Costa, you are about to speak. Please go ahead. All right. Um, there is uh, this scripture in Luke chapter um, twenty-three and verse uh, thirty-four. Actually, it is uh, when Christ is at the cross, nailed on the cross. And uh, this answers the question uh, uh, you asked about, uh, should we only forgive when a person has come to seek for forgiveness or ask for, uh, for forgiveness? And the answer is no. And we see uh, this example from Christ. Uh, so we we'll look chapter 23, verse 34. This is what it says. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Okay? <clears throat> yeah, so this is Christ on the cross. Uh, he's been nailed and he's been mocked at. He's been laughed at. Okay? And nobody at this moment is coming uh, to Christ to say, Oh, Lord, forgive us. We have sinned. Oh, okay? You understand? Jesus, forgive us. We have sinned. No, no one is, is begging him for forgiveness. But instead, what we see is Christ, a uh, voice is, being, you know, um, despised, mocked, and beaten. He prays this prayer to say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And in essence, it also means that Christ himself had forgiven, okay, uh, the the things uh, that we had done unto him. Yeah, so that's the answer to that question. You asked many questions. I've forgotten, yeah. but we'll never okay. remember. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, raising my hand. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brother Costa. I'll be going through the other questions very soon. So uh, at least one thing that we all, we all get in here is that Forgiveness for the Christian is a, should be a natural response. It's not something which we should be debating our, with, within ourselves whether we should do it or not. Then also, uh, the reason why we forgive is because God has already forgiven us. And so, it's, again, it should flow out of us naturally that we forgive others. But then when Jesus Christ said, in, when Jesus Christ said that you can forgive 70 times seven or 77 times. What exactly did he mean by that? Was he saying that uh, then if the person sins against me, let's say 70 times this time, you can go ahead and, 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 and revenge your, avenge yourself. Was that what Jesus was saying? Okay. I think, uh, <laughs> how can, are you going to sit down and be counting it and marking it? <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> so you can mark it. So when he's saying that it's just a long thing for you to let it go and forget it, because are you going to be marking it and see this person is doing that? That, that means you are not forgiving anybody what they're doing to you. So it's a form of telling you indirectly you have to forgive and forget about it. That's what that means. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and I think I like the point that you make that if you are going to think that I, I have to forgive the person uh, 77 times and the 78th time, I, I'm not going to forgive the person. The, the moment you begin counting that Costa has sinned against me five times, he has sinned against me eight times, then that means I've been counting their, uh, his sins against him. 
yeah. and forgiveness mm -hmm. means not counting a person's sins against him. So I think uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 downwards talks about that, that God did not count our sins against us. But then once you begin to, and forgiveness as we already defined also means to wipe the slate clean, to give a person a fresh start. So if a person sins against me and I say I have forgiven him, if he does it again, it becomes like a first time offense to me. I forgive him. If he does it again, it becomes a first time offense to me. So there is always this sense of first time associated with offenses against us so that there is no way that for, the, for a Christian, a person can sin against you 77 times. If you have been counting the number of times that a person has sinned against you, what it means that perhaps you are not a Christian or you are not behaving as one. Because once you're able to count the number of times a person has sinned against you, that means you, you are not a Christian, if I can say that. Okay, then uh, maybe the next question I wanted to ask us here is, uh, Sometimes we talk about the fact that uh, we must forgive and forget. Is that something which is actually practicable? Is it really practicable to, to really forgive and forget? Uh, because I, we, we all know, I'm sure there are people who might have sinned against us 20 years ago. And uh, perhaps even when we get to the place where they did that thing against us, it suddenly comes to mind that this person did this against me. When we, I'm just asking, is it really practicable? Is it something which is really practicable to forgive and forget? Brother Costa or Joseph, uh, if you would want to handle that one. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the is it the phrase <laughs> i in my understanding i think it's not biblical okay <laughs> and it's uh, a phrase that uh, many people like throwing out that say no forgive and forget okay but uh lily yes as a christian are supposed to forgive but then forgetting is another thing i mean it was done to you so hmm. yeah, you can't just pretend like something didn't happen, okay? <laughs> Let me give you a practical example. You are in a relationship and your girlfriend sits on you, okay? Yes, and uh, yeah, you are going to forgive, but is that going to make it now to go away? No, meaning next time you're going to be, uh, to be cautious. And of course, the trust, Okay, will be broken. And, and uh, when you just forgive, that doesn't mean that the trust recovered to prove to say they have changed. So, yes, it's normal to forgive, but uh, forgetting, I think it's, I doubt if it's possible. I doubt if it's possible. But the difference is, even if you remember, because you are a Christian and you're forgiving the person, you are not like trying to bring veggies, okay? Upon the person, trying to do revenge on a person. But you are now looking at a person and say, okay, they did the BC, but I've, I've forgiven them. You are good with a person. You are calm about the situation. But forgetting, mm, mm, I don't know. <laughs> I doubt, I doubt. Okay, any, any other person, uh, any other person with a view, can we forgive and forget? Is it possible to forgive and forget? And I think uh, the statement you made that. Go on, yeah. sister. Oh, okay, I thought, no, you are muted. The Zoom, that's all. Um, it's two different ways. It's forgive and forget. It's not the same thing. You can forgive the person, but forget. Uh, it's, uh, 
some people will say if they don't see the person, they are fine. They forgive them though. But when they see them, then the, the whole thing start boiling up. So forget, it's not everybody can handle that. It's people who are broken down where they will say, okay, never bothers me anyway. But it's hard for some people to forget because it depends how the crime was committed against them. And that's okay. another thing we people have to learn that uh, if it's like that, you are never forgive the person properly. You still holding okay. on it. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I think this particular matter is a little uh, dicey. I agree with Costa and uh, Jemima when they say that, I mean, yes, God expects us to forgive. I think the biblical command is clearly we must forgive. It doesn't add forget. Perhaps the component about forget, trying to forget is, a sort of when you read Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, this is what God says concerning himself, himself. And he says, For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And uh, there are other places where, for instance, you say that as the heavens are, as the east is far from the, uh, uh, from the west, so have I separated your sins from you. So there is that sense in which when God forgives us our sins, mm -hmm. he treats us as people who, as if he doesn't remember the sin. Of course, uh, when we are talking about God, uh, I'm not sure I, I would want to say that God can forget anything. So uh, when we talk about God, we, talk, we can't talk about he forgetting. But then I believe that the issue has got to do with we making sure that uh, we don't count the sins of that person against him again. I think uh, the, the, that, that's what it should be. I'm not, uh, so Costa has wronged me. If I meet Costa and anytime I see Costa, I feel the hurt of what he did to me. My understanding is that we have not yet, for, I have not yet forgiven Costa. But if I see him, and I know that, okay, yes, because I remember that five years ago, you did this against me. In fact, I remember the very shirt that you were wearing. I remember the very spot where you stood. I remember the exact words you said, yet I don't hold it against you. If we get to that point, then I will say that, yes, we are forgiven, even though we still may remember the offense. Uh, Brother Joseph, your hand was up. Uh, you can unmute yourself and speak to me. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, can you hear me? Yes, please go on. Okay. Um, basically, I think you've said what I wanted to say. That's why I had to um, oh. lower my head. Um, I, I'm I believe also to... that... Yeah, I believe that um, when God says... I will forgive them of their sins and I will remember their iniquities or their sins no more. He, he wasn't talking about God somehow losing his memory, you know, being unable to remember things, a thing that we know that is impossible. Um, also with us, I don't also think, <clears throat> excuse me, that God would have us um, forget or lose our memories to the extent in which we can't say this thing happened. Maybe someone is talking to you, this thing happened. You know, some persons who uh, can really make a show of spirituality, you know, when you say, I'm sorry I did this to, to you yesterday, they say, ah, uh, you did that, I can't even remember. When indeed they do, but they just want to give you that fake uh, uh, um, how do I put it? Subjection that they they didn't remember, which of course is a lie. They did, but they just want to say I forget, I've, I've, I've forgotten what happened. I think that's not 
forgetting in some terms of um, the, the scenario is not what is being said here. What it means is that you have uh, forsaken it or forgotten it to be escapes you. It only gives you joy to the point that God has been able to help you in the past. Remembering it is not giving you room for grievous and all that. I think instead of you grieve. Think the it next one just seems to that. rather makes you feel happy that um, you are now free. That even the remembrance of this does not, you know, get you infuriated. I think that's the point. Is generally what everybody. My, my network has not been so sound, so I've not really been following everybody to get you contributions mm -hmm. but i believe that we are we are still in that same thought line uh, meanwhile meanwhile um based uh okay you just lost joseph his network is not too good but i think the import of what joseph is saying is that we we are expected to forgive which is not in doubt Yet, when it comes to about forgetting, essentially what God expects us to do is that when the remembrance of the offense comes, comes to our mind, we don't hold it against the one who offended us. So, I, for instance, there are some offenses which you will never forget. Assuming a person comes, uh, an arm robber comes to your house and hurts you. It, it may be difficult. The mark could be on your skin for the next 20, the next 30 years, and it will be there. Any, anytime you see it, you are going to remember that this person used this knife to cut me. But what God expects us to do is that when I look at the mark and I remember the offense, I don't hold it against the offender that you did this against me. That is what God expects of us. And I trust that uh, uh, there are times that, yes, uh, there are certain situations where it's, it becomes difficult to, but God expects it from us. Okay, so let me, if I may ask again, sometimes it becomes difficult for us to forgive. I've seen Brother Costa's hands up. So I'll ask the question then when he speaks, he tries to answer it as well. What makes it difficult for us to forgive? Please unmute and speak. What makes it difficult for us to express forgiveness to each other? But of course, please unmute and speak. All right. Uh, though I wanted to, to contribute something else. <laughs> OK, all right. So your question was, what makes it difficult? No. Okay, All right. Uh, so I just wanted to add on um, Colossians chapter three. I think it's a passage you read about forgiveness, and I think it's also important to note that actually forgiveness it's a command. Yeah, it's a command. As Christians, we are commanded to. Uh, to forgive. And this is what um, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 13. It says, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must. Okay? It <laughs> must. Yeah. Not uh, you know you have an option, okay? <laughs> yeah. Or no, you can pray about it. Huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. You also must. Just the way Christ forgave you, you also as a Christian, you're commanded uh, to forgive. I think uh, it is it is something to 
do not, as we are doing this study about forgiveness. Yeah, because some people say, no, because of what it did to me, no, because of what happened, therefore, you know, it's like they're trying to justify, okay, to say, ah, this one, yeah, you know, yeah, for sure, you can't forgive. <laughs> but the Bible say, just as Christ forgave you, you also must also uh, forgive. Yeah. Yes, and um, to be honestly, it will not be easy, okay? Uh, some things will not be easy to forgive. But still, uh, this is what the Bible commands us to do, to forgive. Yeah, uh, maybe let me just uh, quickly so uh, touch on your question. What makes it what makes it difficult to forgive? Was it the question? Yes, exactly. What makes it difficult for us to forgive? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, just because we are uh, human, okay, and the sin of nature is still in us, <laughs> and we hate when our ego, okay, is uh, uh, you know uh, dealt with or you know uh, done something with. And so, because we are human, we are in this flesh, you know, uh, we are still sinful, yes, forgiven sinners. And, uh, you know, we are trying by all means, like Jesus Christ. But I think that's the one of the, uh, the first things. Because we are still in this flesh, and sin still uh, resides in us, the remains of sin, rather. Yeah, so, yeah, let others also add on. Thanks. All right, thank you, Costa. And I think to add to the point that you just made that uh, our sense of our human nature, our lack of maturity makes it difficult for us to forgive. One other reason why sometimes we find it difficult to forgive each other is because we, are, we ourselves are not able to appreciate the full extent of God's forgiveness. So in the parable which we looked at in Matthew, we see that this servant, the servant A, he had been forgiven so much. I mean, the amount there, uh, his amount is more than 10 times what uh, the other servant owed him. But because he couldn't appreciate this forgiveness that he had experienced from his master, he now, it made him rather uh, see it as impossible for him to forgive the debts of other people. But I believe that any time that we are tempted not to forgive other people of the offenses, we should go back and look at how much have I been forgiven. If we know how much we have been forgiven, it becomes easy for us to, to, to dish out forgiveness ourselves. Amen. Okay, so uh, if there is any question, you can just lift up your hand then. then then, then we talk. Uh, I wanted us to look at this issue again. Uh, I asked this question. <laughs> okay, Joseph's hand is up. So Joseph, please go ahead. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, you are clear. You can hear me, right? Yes, please. Okay. We can hear um, there's something I'm thinking is a theological um, difficulty in this parable. Like, I've just been thinking through. And this parable is Christ portraying the life of a believer, somebody who has seriously, um, um, who have seriously been exercised in the full forgiveness of, of his or her sin that is reacting like this unforgiving servant. I don't know how to put the question. Like, is it a, a correct believer's attitude that even though forgiveness has been shown him, instead of himself being for, you know, forgiving or loving more, the person is reacting to others in an unforgiving manner. So the question is, is Christ somehow suggesting to us that as believers who could still experience the full extent of his forgiveness and 
still be hardened in our hearts and then afterwards, you know, be um, our sins will still be charged against us and utterly we'll find ourselves in hell because it shows that kind of scenario. Okay, so uh, let me try and answer it this way. I think one, uh, one way in which sometimes we, we will need to interpret the parables is that uh, we can't interpret everything literally that, uh, like usually the, the essence of the parable is just to make some points. So that once you're able to understand those points, the other parts of the parable, I wouldn't say do not matter, but then they don't count towards making of the point. In this parable, we see that uh, when you read from verse 15, the reason why Jesus gave the parable was an answer to what in response to a question that Peter had asked him. So from verse 15, we see that Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out the person's fault to him just between the two of you. If there is peace, fine. If the matter is still not settled, get two or three people to join you and go and settle it with your brother. So if it's not settled, get the church involved. And if the church is involved and it's still not settled, treat the person as an unbeliever. Then Peter, after hearing this, now asks, okay, then in that case, how many times should my brother sin against me that I should forgive him? And I'm sure in Peter asking this question, using my brother or my sister, it could be in the context of fellow disciples. And by experience, one thing that I've come to know, it may not be written anywhere, perhaps if it's not written, you can cite me as, as the author, is that usually it's those who are close to us who, who would offend us. For people who are not close to us, it may be very, they may not need our forgiveness on anything. For instance, uh, I have hardly met uh, Brother Joseph. So there is nothing for me to forgive him about. He hasn't done anything against me. I hardly know him. So it would be nearly impossible to be saying that he has done things against me that he, he needs my forgiveness. Rather, it says the brother who is close to me, that's, uh, that I frequent with so often, he's the one that I would be, it will become necessary for me to forgive. Then again, was Jesus, was Jesus saying that it is possible that a Christian would have an unforgiving spirit and because he refuses to forgive, it, it will lead him into hell? I would rather say that Jesus Christ by this parable is confirming that if a person refuses to appreciate the forgiveness of God and this person continues to show unforgiveness to others, the person has confirmed that he does not, he is undeserving of the kingdom of God. That person has confirmed that he actually deserves hell. Essentially, what I'm saying is that Jesus is saying that person is not a Christian. If a person keeps on holding offenses and does not forgive others, Jesus Christ is confirming that that person is not a Christian. And I think when we read about all the uh, when we read about all the verses of forgiveness, we see that forgiveness is always a command. And earlier, we also uh, understood that we forgive the, in response to what God in Christ has, has done for us. So if that natural reaction is not coming, then it is possible that we have not even experienced this forgiveness from God in the first place. And if a person has not experienced this forgiveness from God, then I can boldly say that person is not yet a Christian. I don't know whether Joseph would buy my answer. Or perhaps if a, a brother or a sister would want to add something to it. Okay, so I'm sure Joseph will come back. Um, so, yes, hello. Um, no, you, you, you said if um, we haven't 
tasted of, of the forgiveness of God. I mean, then we, we will say, um, how do I, how do you mean, how do you mean say? Like you, you are trying to compare um, a Christian who can't forgive his fellow Christian saying that if he doesn't, then he has not really tasted of the forgiveness of God, right? Yes, yes. I can be very emphatic about oh, okay. that. And yeah, the right. other is like, that if a Christian yes, has it's true. Problem, I I agree because I agree because um before right. you you come to become even a Christian, obviously through salvation you are being forgiven of your sins, and you are being worse. I mean your sins are being worse that way. So even just that act alone, even your salvation stage alone, that one is another form of forgiveness. Before even when you sin daily. We have been forgiven um, when we have forgiveness of sins. We have been forgiven on o- o- almost like a daily basis. So uh, I mean, I, I think I think what you said is true. What you said is true. Yeah, that sometimes we also forget as humans. We f- sometimes forget, and then maybe pride can be the reason why a brother will not want to forgive his, his brother. It can be as a result a lot of pride, or can be a lot of, I mean. I don't know, I don't say forgetfulness, but it does happen, it does happen. I mean, as Brother Costa said, right, he said, because of our human nature, sometimes um, we, we, we do things in a kind of way. And then I think that's the reason, that's the reason, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, maybe I can also contribute something. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, yeah, I think you gave a full packaged answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, which was uh, uh, good. And also, Brother Prince's addition. I also just want to, uh, to add on something uh, on the answer you gave. Uh, so I think the other way we can also look at it is uh, uh, to point out that actually unforgiveness is sin. Okay? Unforgiveness is sin. It's like hatred, you know, it goes into hatred, and then there's bitterness, uh, which are basically the fruits of the flesh, okay, or the works of the flesh. And um, what we see in First John chapter 3, and verse 9, and this is what the Bible says. Whosoever has been born of God does not sin. And of course, the idea is that whoever has been born of God does not continue in sin. Okay? For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. First John chapter 3 and verse 9. So someone who's uh, continuing, persisting in unforgiveness, even when they have been approached, okay? Even when they know that what they are doing is sinful and is wrong, but they still, you know, continue or demand. I think, like, we were, like you said, it shows that this person is not a believer. This person is not a Christian. Yeah, because... A child of God will not continue in sin. Nabish, but this, this is sin, but they are still continuing, still holding on. Yeah, so I think it shows something. Yeah. Okay, thank you, my brother. Thanks. Okay, so uh, Joseph has sent me a message and I was trying to read it. Says, uh, is this forgiveness an objective or subjective reality in that person's life? And by that, he's asking whether uh, it is something that the sinner has already experienced and still went to act in such an unseemly manner. Sorry, sorry. Go. Okay, so I do believe that. Uh, uh, and what's the pastoral implication for a preacher of the gospel? 
I think when it comes to for, uh, forgiveness, unforgiveness, and when we are preaching the gospel, uh, I'm not too sure I can answer. Uh, they, they are really deep questions, and I would want to take my time to reflect on Joseph's question before I answer them. But what I would say on the surface is that God expects every Christian to forgive. It's actually a command as we know it. And it's not a command which is too difficult for us to fulfill too. And the reason is, as Christians, we have been inhabited or the Holy Spirit lives in us to transform us into the image of Christ daily. So as Christians, every day we become like Christ. And uh, Brother Costa earlier read from Luke chapter 23, I think verses when Jesus was on the cross and uh, even when they were sinning against them, this is what he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they, they are doing. And later when Peter is writing his own gospel in first Peter chapter two, that's what Peter will say uh, concerning how Jesus Christ lived. And he said, the way Jesus Christ lived, it has become an example for us to also follow. Uh, in 1 Peter 2, 21, it says, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revel in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And so this is the example to which we've been called. And it's, it's my conviction and it's my belief that for us as Christians, each day we are being transformed into this image of Christ, uh, of Christ likeness. We are being transformed into these imitators of God so that uh, even na our natural self would find it difficult to forgive. But then the God living in us would make it possible for us to forgive. So forgiveness, I would say, it is not an easy thing. It is difficult, but it is possible. And by that, when I'm talking about forgiveness, I'm talking about all forms of sins that are done against us. There are times that as Christians, we tend to go like, okay, there are some sins that you can forgive and there are some sins that you can't forgive. I don't find that teaching in the Bible. The Bible expects us to forgive every kind of sin that is done against us. Every kind of sin that is done against us, the Bible expects us to forgive. In uh, my next question would focus on this. Uh, I think Brother Costa uh, again made a statement. I heard him mention uh, bitterness and some other things. Uh, if I don't forgive, or if I don't learn how to forgive, what are the implications for my own life? If I don't forgive others, what are the implications for my own life? And I, I would think that one implication would be that it, it would mean that myself, perhaps I've not been able to fully appreciate the forgiveness of God. That is one. Another implication could be that unforgiveness always breeds bitterness and bitterness leads to destruction. Unforgiveness, when we keep on harboring sins in us, it will lead to uh, bitterness and bitterness will lead to destruction. In view of that, when the writer of the book of Hebrews was writing to uh, the congregation that he wrote to, in Hebrews chapter, uh, so Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, this is what uh, I'll read from verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it, many become defiled. 
I believe that this is one area of this is one area of uh, of unforgiveness that people have not averted their mind towards. That if a person sins against me, and I keep on harboring that offense in my heart, it is going to develop into bitterness. And bitterness, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 15, is like cancer. It, it will destroy or it will defile the whole body. Let us take this example. Uh, right here, we have several nationalities represented here. We have Costa from Zambia. I think Joseph should be Nigerian, I, I, I guess. And assuming uh, Costa does something against me, and I don't forgive him. What could happen is that with time, because I keep on harboring that, uh, that, that uh, offense, I am going to teach my children that this man is a very wicked person. He did this against me. So you two don't do any good to him. Then Costa would also train his children that this family, they are very wicked. Don't mind them. They are, they are very wicked people. So very soon, what started out as a fight between myself and Costa, we have been able to recruit our children to succeed us in that fight. Then our children would also recruit uh, their own children, our grandchildren to fight. So you may have people who would fight them about something and they may not even know the genesis of the issue. So when the Bible says that the root of bitterness, if it is not dealt with, it can lead to the destruction of many. This is just one example of how it can come. And by this, this is how many churches have been destroyed. This is how many families have been destroyed. This is how many partnerships, business partnerships have been destroyed because there was an offense and they failed to forgive each other. And because they failed to forgive each other, they, they will recruit other people to join them in this fight and it always doesn't end well. So that is one implication of our un unforgiveness. And so one may ask the question, how do we avoid this? I think the, the best way to avoid something like this is that forgiveness should be something which is done immediately. There are times that uh, people would want to wait for the other partner to come and apologize before, uh, before we forgive. Yes, you may choose to do that, but the temptation or the, the, the disadvantage of doing that is that whilst you wait for the person to come and ask for forgiveness, the seed of bitterness is growing whilst you wait, it keeps growing. And no one knows when it will grow to the point where it can begin to cause distraction amongst many people. So because of that, quickly we forgive, as and when the, forgi as and when the offenses come, we should actually make spaces for the fact that people are going to offend us and because they are going to offend us, we would, um, we would forgive them in advance. Again, if we fail to forgive people on time, it even hinders our own fellowship with God. Uh, one clear example is what Peter will tell husbands that husbands, if you don't deal well, well with your wives, it would even affect your prayers to God. And I think this is something which no husband would want to be in that situation that because of your wife, you can't even uh, have any fellowship with God. Then uh, again, if we fail to forgive immediate, immediately, or when we fail to forgive, it robs us of the peace and joy that we can enjoy on this earth. It robs us of the peace and joy that we can enjoy on this earth. So I believe that th there, are, there, are many, uh, there are many implications of forgiveness and the whole theme of forgiveness as Jesus Christ presented in Matthew 18. There are many lessons that we can learn from there. But the main lesson, which I think uh, 
or one of the main lessons we can learn is that God has forgiven us so much, like the master in the, like the king in, in the parable. He, he forgives so much and he expects that we should forgive each other or we should forgive others. Uh, that is how I would summarize this particular uh, passage. So I've seen Joseph's hand up. Joseph, please unmute yourself and speak. Then after that, ev everyone else will give his conclusion or the lesson that he learned. Then I'm sure we can close. Joseph, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I just an adding to the things or footnotes to the things you've already uh, mentioned. I agree with you, everything. Um, another implication, I'm also thinking that um, this would have to us or to anyone who refuses to forgive. First of all, is a direct affront to, um, to the commandment of God, to the God who have commanded, who has commanded that we should forgive. And then you went on in unforgiveness. You are being deviant to his will and to his uh, command. Another thing also I think it does is that it destroys um, gospel or salvation assurance. Um, once a man is living in an, in an unforgiving life, if you're being sincere and your conscience is still alive, you, you continuously be um, doubting, if indeed you're one of God's people, just as um, Paul will counsel us to examine ourselves to actually see if we are in faith. When you keep seeing this bitterness and unforgiving spirit in you, and then you just oppose yourself with the person of Christ, you discover that there's uh, a far difference between you and the life of Christ. It, it will continue to dawn on you that you're not making advance into the path of sanctification and glory. So you continuously be doubting your salvation. But another thing also I think I will stop after saying this. Another thing I also think it will, um, that will be the implication uh, is that of hindrance to further forgiveness of God. You know, when Christ was teaching his disciples of about how they, they could pray to the Father, he said, forgive us our trespasses um, as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. We know also there is a theological challenge there. It's not as though God only forgives us because we are forgiving others. That would be good works. But it means that as people who indeed have experienced the grace of God, uh, we should live a life of both repentance and, and uh, also uh, forgiveness. Since we know that we are sinners, there's a sense in which the remaining sin, we still offend. There are many, in many ways, we, we offend and we offend every sin particularly is an offense to God. So if we must keep expecting God's forgiveness, which of course comes with peace and joy, we must continually forgive others. And failure to do that will hinder such um, grace and blessing from God himself. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Joseph. Okay, Kota, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, just a quick one. Um, yeah, I think uh, most of the things have been saying, have been said, and yeah, I've been learning a lot here. I just want to add on something uh, from what I've been said already, probably, and it's um, uh, I think it came from your answer when you are answering. I think uh, Joseph, when you asked about the question, does this parable describe, you know, the life of a Christian? And uh, I agree with your answer to say no, but it teaches us something, and which is forgiveness, but it doesn't, you know, uh, describe the life of a Christian. Yeah, to say if a Christian give and then he probably, you know, will end up in hell or something like that. And just to add on to that, I just want to read a few passages to say uh, a Christian uh, can never lose his salvation. Because if we say, you know, if, if he doesn't forgive and he's a Christian, then you go to hell. Uh, when we say that, it simply means that 
a Christian can lose a salvation. Hope you, you understand. And um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, and uh, this is what it says, uh, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame uh, before him in love. Verse 5, having predestined as to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Okay, so basically there is about uh, uh, predestination and election. To say a Christian or a believer has been chosen even before the foundation of uh, the world. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, they, they, nothing can stop them uh, being saved. Nothing can stop them uh, getting into the kingdom of God. Because through Jesus Christ, uh, God uh, uh, forgave them of their sins. Uh, the other one, quickly, is Romans chapter 8 and verse 30. Romans chapter 8 and verse 30, this is what the Bible says. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. So that's, that's, that's a Christian, an elect of God. So God has predestined them before the foundations of the earth. Uh, the next thing, uh, God calls them, and that's by now saving them physically when they are born and at a time God has appointed, and then justification, which is, you know, uh, basically the same, and then after justification, this is, this is the final stage or the final step, it's glorification. So whoever God has chosen, they will be uh, glorified. Yeah, I just thought of uh, mentioning that. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. God bless you. So uh, I'm sure uh, we could, we've had enough for today. God bless you for joining us. Very soon I'll be handing over to Prince to, so that he, he carries forth whatever needs to be done from here. But uh, as, as we know from this, I, I trust that the Spirit of God will lead us into all truth, especially concerning matters of forgiveness. You know that there are times that some things happen and it's difficult to express this as we should, but I, I, maybe perhaps one day, if I'm invited again, we could look at some other implications. Uh, I know Joseph asked about uh, some of these pastoral implications of unforgiveness. And I'll just mention this in a sentence that the reason why even now we have a lot or we have some Christians, at least where I am in Ghana, we have Christians who would be praying what they call dangerous prayers. That's prayers against, uh, against people who they perceive as enemies. Uh, it's because of unforgiveness. But then even if the person is an enemy, what, the, what does the word of God teach us to? How does the word of God teach us to relate to such a fellow? I'm sure one day, uh, time is up today, we can't do that, but another time we could look at that. God bless you all for joining us today. I've seen Chilambe's hand up. Since he hasn't spoken today, uh, I will permit him to speak. Chilambe, please speak. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity. I was, I was at work, I was just alive at home. I was in transit and I couldn't speak when I was that side. <laughs> I think uh, this 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 topic of uh, forgive, forgiveness has been mentioned in so many passages in the in the New Testament. I know I know it's it's very difficult to practice this, but I think the emphasis and the retaliation in the passages it is a call to us that it is a non-negotiable. We really need to do it when we are when we are Christians. And I'm sure most of the questions have been answered well. I appreciate that. But again, to mention on the, I think on the dangerous prayers, I, I saw something that when, when, when Stephen was being stoned, he couldn't, he couldn't say anything evil against those people who were persecuting him. And someone reminded us that, did you, are you aware of the person, one of the person who was standing when Stephen was being stoned? Because if he, if he had prayed a dangerous prayer, then we couldn't have Paul. We couldn't have, uh, have Paul because Paul was there 
when Stephen was being stoned. So if he, if he had played that everyone could be slain that day, then we couldn't have had three quarters of the New Testament. So this issue of uh, dangerous prayer, I'm sure it's just the lack of understanding of who we are. And so forgiveness is paramount. We shouldn't, I, I know it's very difficult, but this is what we, we, we've been called. We didn't need to be denying our comfort when we want to be Christians. I know it's, it's, it's comfortable when you are hungry with, it feels comfortable when you are hungry with somebody because you have a justification that they wronged you. But Christ and the Bible and the God is calling us to forgive our friends. And that's the reason that I, I'm going out with, although it's, it's difficult, but it's what my Lord has commanded me to do. Thank you. Thank you. Chilambi, God bless you. Okay, so uh, we've already done uh, five minutes beyond. Oh, okay, wow. Yes, uh, I I'll need to make this announcement. EAR, Ecclesia Africanus Reformanda. Friends, are you going to do this or I should do it? Please kindly do it. I mean, finish everything with us. <laughs> okay, all right. So on Monday, that's uh, today is 23rd July. Sunday is 25th. The Monday, same time that we met today, uh, there will be EAR, that's Ecclesia Africanus Reformanda. Uh, it's, it's a map It simply means, Ecclesia means church. Africanus means Africa. Reformanda, uh, it's reformation. So reforming the African church. Uh, I'm sure wherever you are, in whichever country you find yourself in Africa, you might have course about some of the things that go on in some of our churches. And uh, EAR is one platform where we discuss some of the issues. This month's, uh, this month's topic or theme is on uh, reformed theology versus Pentecostal theology. I think it was started last month and we will continue this month with Pastor Osinachi Nwoko from Nigeria, from Lagos, Nigeria. So we trust that for those of us here, we'll be here, then we'll uh, invite others to also join us because it's a very essential topic. So we hope to see you all. Thank you and God bless you. Friends, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Pastor Chambers, uh, for a very wonderful exposition, and um, we I really enjoyed I really enjoyed it tonight. I really enjoyed it tonight. Um, I really learned a lot about forgiveness. Also, that is not just based on our it's not based on our um, idea about forgiveness, but then we forgive because God forgave us first. Okay, so on Monday, every Monday, we also meet and pray at two minutes. So not just here, here is our monthly program. The Bible talk is a weekly thing that we do. But on Mondays also, we just meet to pray every Monday at 7 p.m. GMT. At 9, 9, 9 p.m. GMT, yeah, rather. So you can ask whenever you are free. And then, so this is my ministries, and then this is what we do. And then, so God willing, on Monday, we'll be having the ear. And I just want, I just pray that everyone will be around. It's the Reformed versus um, Pentecostalism. So what does it mean to be in a Reformed church? What does it mean to be in a Pentecost church? What does it mean, I mean Pentecostalism as a whole? So I don't want you to miss. Try and let us all be there and then, um, I think, yeah, we can we can study the word of God together and we'll get to know more. As the word says, that we may know the truth and the truth will set us free. Okay, so God bless everybody for coming on. Those who are with us on Facebook, those who are with us on Zoom at the moment. God bless you all. And we wish, we wish to see you coming Monday for the EL. Okay, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Um, I think before we close, we have to say a prayer. So sorry. Let me say a short prayer for us to, to close. So Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this evening. 
Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, and we thank you, Lord, for the discussion. We pray, oh Lord, that may you continue to help us that we, we will live according to your word as we learn to forgive others. We pray that may you not be carnal-minded, carnal but may you help us, oh Lord, to be able to forgive, even in situations where it seems to be so difficult and so hard. But we pray, oh Lord, that may you continue to transform us by your word, that we will live according to your will, and we will bring glory unto your name. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. So amen. God bless everybody. See you on Monday for the EL. Yeah, sure.